It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Uh, it's really apparent that we're now in the third wave of COVID-19, and folks are pretty worried that this Premier and the government are sleepwalking us into another massive lockdown. Late on Friday, we all know that the Premier loosened indoor restrictions uh, for uh, COVID-19 precautions and didn't put in any of the measures uh, that would help people stay safe in those situations. So the question is, why does the Premier seem to be doing exactly the opposite of what his own experts and, and frontline health care providers are suggesting he should be doing? question is to the Premier. Thank, thank you for the question, and through you, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we're doing. We're following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, along with the local medical officers uh, in, in Peel and in Toronto. We had a great discussion. That was their, their direction. We followed the direction, and we're going to continue uh, following the direction of uh, the docs. Thanks. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, in fact, the um, government hasn't been following the experts' advice, and now we're in a third wave that was preventable. On February 11th, the science table warned that rushing the reopening was going to lead to disaster. They were telling the Premier and this government that they needed to put measures in place to keep people safe, like paid sick days. The very next day, the Premier reopened indoor eating, for example, in restaurants, basically sending restaurant workers into an environment where the spread was likely to happen without even the basics, like paid sick days, to rely upon. The question is, why is this Premier refusing to spend the money necessary, Speaker, to keep people safe, to make sure that we don't end up in another massive lockdown in our province, notwithstanding question. that he keeps getting advice on how to do exactly that? And the Premier? Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, we have the toughest restrictions on all of North America, you know, and that, that's that's actual, actual facts. And uh, so so far, uh, we've vaccinated 1,553,000 people. Uh, the total vaccines are about 1.79 million. We've ramped up the vaccination center, as as uh, the majority of the people have heard that uh, now we're doing 75 plus in mass uh, vaccination centers. We've increased the pharmacies from 350 to 700. But uh, the problem is, uh, Mr. Speaker, we still, we still need uh, more vaccines because we're just a, a fraction of the way on the full capacity. Full capacity, if we just had all the vaccines we needed, we'd be about 9 million people uh, a month. But we're looking forward to getting uh, more shipments this week from the federal government. Final supplementary. Speaker, Speaker uh, Dr. Brown, the head of Ontario's COVID, Ontario's COVID advisory table, said this, if public health measures are lifted, cases could rise dramatically. Dr. Peter, Peter, Juni said, or Peter Uni said this, we're heading for another lockdown. Now, these are what the experts are saying. These are quotes directly from the expert speaker. So my question to the Premier is, why does he continue to ignore these repeated pieces of advice from the experts and instead seem to be just walking us straight into another massive lockdown in our province. Premier. Then through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we listen to the experts. We have the panel of docs that give us advice every single day, and we appreciate the great job Dr. Williams and his whole team as Don and the other experts. And, you know, once they give us the green light, we, we go to uh, thorough discussions on uh, when we open up, how we open up, and they give us a direction and we follow that, that direction. And that's exactly what we've done. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next question is uh, also for the Premier. Uh, this is about warnings from the hospital sector. In fact, uh, Anthony Dale, about a month ago from the Ontario Hospital Association, said this, and I quote, the warning to the Premier could not have been clearer. An exhausted, overextended hospital sector is likely going to have to deal with a third pandemic wave. Ultimately, the consequences of and responsibility for today's decision to reopen on February 16th rests with the government of Ontario. Will the Premier admit 
that in fact he refused to listen to this warning from the Ontario uh, Hospital Association and those frontline exhausted and overworked healthcare providers and, and are now putting at risk the capacity of these hospitals to keep people well in Ontario. To reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. And in fact, I can advise the leader of the official opposition that we have been building up hospital capacity since the beginning of this pandemic. We have built over and created over 3,100 more hospital beds across the province of Ontario, which is the equivalent of six medium-sized hospitals. We've also recently received approval to spend up to $125 million to create more uh, int intensive care beds and medicine beds in case there are any increases in our numbers so that we will be able to make sure that we can admit and treat any patients with COVID-19 or have to be admitted to hospital for any other reason. This is something that we have dealt with from the beginning of this pandemic, and we're continuing to build capacity today. Supplementary question. Speaker, right now, today, doctors in ICUs are actually desperately transferring patients that they cannot care for. The hardest hit communities, unbelievably, the hardest hit communities in our province have been left behind by the Ford government. They're getting the least support of all. Dr. Fallis, as you all probably all know, Dr. Brooks Fallis from the William Osler uh, Hospital, the cr a critical care physician, said this, and I quote, this government is either completely incompetent or has no regard for the health and lives of Ontarians, or both. My question is to the Premier. These frontline health care workers are exhausted. They feel abandoned by their government. Why will the government question. not admit, why will the Premier not admit that he made the wrong call? The third wave is upon us. He needs to put in measures to tamp it down. Will he do it? Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, it's funny. Uh, Leader of the Opposition mentioned Anthony Dale. Not, uh, I'm not going to divulge private messages, but basically on Tuesday, good afternoon, Premier. I want to thank you very much for the comments you made, made about being vigilant. I, I won't go on with the rest of the, the message. So the Leader of the, oppo the, the, leader, the, the leader, leader of the Opposition can point out the, the great doctors, because even Docs that disagree, and they disagree, by the way, with our chief medical officer, and a lot of local medical officers, and and God knows how many other doctors. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? I talk to endless doctors every single week. Uh, I talk to endless CEOs, public health unit docs, and they're all they're all saying, "Hey, we're we're moving as quickly as we we can to crush this curve, to knock off the, the third wave." Response. And we appreciate the the work that you're doing. And my comment back to them. I appreciate the work you're doing. So we, we have a great uh, relationship with the, the docs, and you you can find out of 15,000 docs, you're going to find a few that may not agree, but uh, they're still doing a great job. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the reality is, by many, many experts, this Premier and this government were warned that a rushed reopening was going to lead to disaster, that the government could avoid a third wave by putting some basic things in place, like paid sick days, like making our schools safer with lower class sizes, better ventilation and other measures. But they didn't want to spend the money. The Ford government did not want to spend the money, Speaker. So my question is, why did the government think it was all right to ignore the ex advice of experts, uh, instead put people uh, in the line of fire when it comes to uh, the uh, spread of the virus? Uh, and why does he still, at this moment, refuse to acknowledge that he can stop another massive lockdown in Ontario by doing the right thing, investing Question. the money, and keeping people safe in Ontario? And the Premier to reply. You, Mr. Speaker, I, I think all the frontline healthcare workers have done an incredible job. And when the leader of the opposition is criticizing me, she's criticizing all the docs and the frontline healthcare workers, which is not which is not helpful uh, at all, Mr. Speaker. And I, I understand, and I, I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, proud of this figure, but you know the NDP spend money, spend money, spend money. And I'm not proud of this, but I said right from Order. the get-go, I will not spare Order. I will not spare a penny, and we haven't. We have a $38 billion deficit. Can't wait to get the economy going on. 
we spent tens of billions of dollars to protect the lives and the safety of every single resident here in Ontario, along with protecting Order. the livelihoods as well of small businesses right across this uh, province. So overall, I think uh, the people of Ontario have done an incredible job. Spon Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. Speaker, as of Friday, the end of what would have been March break, one in five of all schools in this province have COVID outbreaks. 44 schools are closed, including 10 in Dufferin Peel Catholic Board alone, where an outbreak at one school sent three education workers to hospital. We have 140 new cases in our schools today. Schools are closed in Woodstock, in Hamilton, in London, in Sudbury, in Mississauga, and the list goes on and on and on, and it grows every day. Speaker, the Premier and the Minister of Education have said repeatedly that they want schools open. Why then are they standing by while so many are forced to close? To respond to the government, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, in this province, 99.2 per cent of schools are open uh, as we contend with the variants of concern. In this province, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the foremost medical authority in Ontario, has suggested schools have been and continue to be safe places to uh, go to go to school. In fact, I spoke to the Chief Medical Officer of Health this past week, to Dr. Lowe in Peel, to Dr. Davila in Toronto, Dr. Etches in Ottawa between Friday and the present, all of whom have confirmed that the program, the infection prevention protocols in place have helped to keep schools safe and they are working, notwithstanding the necessity for vigilance, which is why the province invested $1.6 billion. It's why we lead with the most comprehensive protocol to date. And it's why we'll continue to follow the medical advice to ensure schools, yes, remain open and remain safe in Ontario. Okay. Okay. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what the minister doesn't get here, but this situation is very serious. Back to the Premier. We are seeing more than 500 children catching this virus every single week. Faster spreading variants are running rampant, and frontline workers in our schools are telling us again that they aren't seeing any new supports. We're still, this government is already warning that there are more cuts coming. The asymptomatic testing program has never met its 50,000 tests a week goal and hasn't even reached half of that over the life of the entire program. Speaker, the time for half measures is surely over. What will the Premier do today to keep every student, every teacher, and every education worker safe from a third wave? Minister of Education. The Premier will continue to follow the best medical expert advice to ensure schools can remain open, which is a contrasting position of the members opposite, who have sided with other interests who wanted us to keep them closed in September, in October, certainly not reopen in February, and would have kept them closed for a stay-at-home order into March. This government is on the side of parents who believes very strongly order. that schools must be open for the Order. mental health and the development of a child. That is consequential to their life, and we are on their side. We are going to continue to invest $1.6 billion, which has yielded over 3,000 net new teachers, 1,400 more custodians, 800 more being hired in the teacher realm, temporary hires, another 400 custodians. We've improved air ventilation well over 95% of schools, as reported by the school boards themselves publicly. We will continue to follow the advice, providing PP to every educator, to every student, because yes, we understand it is serious, and we are committed Spons? to rising to the challenge to keep these schools open and safe in this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. The long-term care wait list has been a growing problem for decades. As of December 2020, it was reported that there are 40,000 people waiting for care they need in long-term care homes. The Financial Accountability Office found in an October 2019 report the previous government increased the number of long-term care spaces by only 0.8 per cent, while the population over the age of 75 grew by 20 per cent. In my riding of Durham, we have long wait lists, and I often hear from constituents the frustrations they have trying to get their loved ones the care they need. Ontarians deserve to have confidence that they can receive the care they need when they need it. Minister, my constituents want to know, what are you doing to shorten the long-term care wait list? Thank you. Questions to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member of Durham for all the good work that she does. 
not only on behalf of constituents, but for uh, residents in long-term care and the long-term care home sector. She really is a tireless advocate for her constituents. We lost a lot of runway while the previous government neglected long-term care, building only 611 net new spaces between 2011 and 2018. Our government has been working hard to fill that gap that the Liberals left behind. Last week, I announced 80 new projects across the province, and we are investing $933 million in these projects on top of the $1.75 billion already committed to building 30,000 new spaces over 10 years. One of those projects is Port Perry Place, which will lead to 192 new Response. and 32 upgraded long-term care spaces in the member's riding, and that's in addition to a project in Bowmanville that will build 125 new and 99 upgraded beds. Uh, that totals 1,970 net new beds in the Durham region. Our government. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for the response and, and the investment in Durham region. I agree that building new beds is essential to filling the gap in capacity that has been allowed to build up under the previous government. But there are also homes built to design standards from the 1970s, and we need to upgrade those to modern standards, eliminating ward rooms, for example. We saw the effect of crowded older facilities during the pandemic, and Port Perry Place was one of the homes that had a serious outbreak. Tragically, Speaker, 13 residents lost their lives during that outbreak. It really underscores, Speaker, the need to redevelop and upgrade existing spaces to modern design standards. Can the minister please tell this House what she is doing to upgrade and modernize existing homes that need it? Again, the Minister of Long-Term Care will reply. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and, and once again, thank you to the member from Durham. It is crucial that we acknowledge and learn from the tragedy that unfolded during the pandemic at homes across the province and at Port Perry Place and at homes like it. It underlines the urgency of upgrading older homes. And this latest round of allocations prioritized upgrading older homes in response to those lessons learned around improved IPAC measures, particularly eliminating those four-bed wardrooms. Port Perry Place has been allocated 96 new spaces and 70 upgraded ones, and that's on top of the 53 beds previously allocated. This project is going to mean a new home in a totally new building built to modern standards in Port Perry with spaces for 224 residents. Response. Our government is repairing and rebuilding long-term care after decades of neglect by previous governments. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A recent CBC News report highlighted a map of all of the pharmacies administering vaccines in Toronto. It revealed that some of the wealthiest communities with the lowest transmission rates also had some of the most pharmacy vaccine locations. Alternatively, communities full of essential workers that have had some of the highest transmissions were noticeably bare. For instance, out of the 39 pharmacies in my community, just one is administering vaccines. Premier, this is an example of how pandemic response does not equate to risk or need. The science advisory table has said that a vaccine rollout strategy targeting not just age, but also risk of contracting COVID-19 could save many lives. Communities like mine in Northwest Toronto need more vaccine locations immediately. When will you add more of these sites in at-risk communities? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, our uh, vaccine rollout system will allow Ontarians to receive vaccines at hospitals, mobile clinics, mass vaccination clinics, pharmacies, and of course, primary care offices, particularly for people with pre-existing health conditions. With respect to the pharmacies, we had started the project in Toronto, in Windsor-Essex, and in Kingston-Frontenac with approximately 325, 330 pharmacies. But those are going to be rolled out across the province in neighbourhoods everywhere to 700. It will be doubling it within the next two weeks and then doubling that again between now and the end of April so that everyone, regardless of where they live in Ontario, will be able to receive a vaccine if they Wish to receive the AstraZeneca vaccine at any pharmacy close to them. This is we just started off with 325, Spons. but it will be moving across the province very quickly. 
Yeah, the supplementary question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I would ask the minister and this government to stick to the facts like they have always stated. The fact is this government has failed to prioritize hard-hit communities. My community of Scarborough is one of the hardest hit in the province just like my colleagues uh, writing as well. But when it came to putting equitable strategy, this government has failed. Just this morning, this government voted against the motion to implement an equitable vaccine strategy. Speaker, when it came to COVID testing centers, this government failed, and our, our community had to fight for more uh, COVID testing centers. When it came to COVID relief, our communities had to fight for more support. When it came to more vaccines now, yet again, we are fighting for more vaccines for our hardest hit communities. With the lack of access to clear communication and more vaccines, our communities are left in the dark. So I would ask again, will this government commit today to more equitable vaccines for our hardest hit communities like Scarborough, Mr. Speaker? And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the short answer is yes, but Speaker, I would say through you to the member opposite, sp speaking about the facts, we have created a very equitable plan for the distribution of vaccines across the province, including a bioethics specialist on the vaccine task force. This was created with a lot of thought, with a lot of effort, with a lot of looking at areas across the province that have been hardest hit. And so while our distribution of the vaccines is based primarily on population size, it also builds in factors relating to the, uh, the situations in each community and communities that have been the hardest hit. And in those communities, they will be receiving more vaccines because they need to in order to get the level of transmission down. So we have paid attention to that from the beginning and will continue to do so in the future. And uh, saying specifically to this member, your area will be receiving more vaccines because they Spons? have been more badly hit by COVID-19. The next question. The member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier. I want to speak specifically about the Peel region that has consistently seen the highest rates of COVID-19 infections in the province and has been in lockdown since November 23rd. As of today, there are a total of 312 total active cases in the Peel District School Board and different Peel Catholic District School Board with 221 closed classroom and 13 closed school. The infection rate has impacted the region to the point of shutting down schools, workplaces, and transit. My question is, what is the government doing to reverse this very concerning trend and protect the residents of Peel? For help. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. There are several areas that have been very badly hit by COVID-19, and as the member will know, that Peel and Toronto are still in grey that they are still in uh, the, the most significant area of lockdown because of the levels of transmission. So we are working very hard in both of those areas to help get the numbers down, which is why many services still remain closed. We are going to continue to work on that. And again, as I indicated earlier, in those areas that have been particularly badly hit by COVID-19, they will receive additional uh, levels of vaccines in order to ensure that the people that are uh, transmitting it, because we know that there are significant concerns in parts of Peel as well as in Toronto, to get those levels down so that those areas can then move, transition into a different part of the framework. But those concerns are very evident to us and we are working on them daily. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Premier. Um, on March 15, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Williams, stated that it is appropriate to prioritize sectors at higher risk of infection in lockdown zones. Peel was already left out of the first round of pharmacy vaccination appointments, despite having the highest rates of infection in the province. So my question is, can the government commit today and tell the residents of Peel that they will be prioritized to get the vaccination and for the 300,000 at-risk essential workers in Peel? Minister of Health. Well, absolutely they will be. We are uh, rolling out the vaccines across the province in the mass vaccination centres, but of course many people wish to receive the um, AstraZeneca vaccine in pharmacies, which is now available to, to people. Anyone over 60 years of age can receive that vaccine. That's recently been changed by Health Canada and by NACI, that it is effective for people over age 65, so that the, there are more openings than ever that are coming in. We haven't received a significant volume of vaccines 
up to date, but I can advise, and this is on the federal government's website, that we will be receiving 1,194,000 and so on vaccines from Pfizer, of which Ontario will receive 466,000 in the next two weeks. So we will be able to expand that. We are going to be expanding the pharmacies where the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine can be obtained as well, and that is going to be expanded Response? across the province, including in the region of Peel. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. The French Ontario University will open its doors in September of 2021. How will this university contribute to the flourishing of the Franco Ontarian community? The Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to my colleague for her question. On the French Ontario University will be a very important thing for Francophones in the southwest of the province who are suffering from a lack of French language instruction. The central southwest region of Ontario will soon have the will soon have half of Ontario's Francophone population. I've always believed in this project. It is a post-secondary institution which will prepare students to get the skills they need and will help us address the uh, bilingual workforce shortage in Ontario. I'm very happy that I reached an agreement with the federal government so that this university can be created. It's the first university governed for and by francophones, and it represents the culmination of a long-standing dream. Thank you. Supplementary question. I'd like to thank the minister for this important accomplishment. The International Week of Francophony was celebrated throughout the world last week. How did the government observe this occasion? I would like to thank my colleague for her question. On Monday, we announced that we will offer a training at the Boreal College. On Tuesday, we said that we will keep investing millions of dollars in order to better integrate newcomers. On Wednesday, the Francophone flag uh, was put in front of our different buildings. And then we said that we would add new beds uh, in long-term care francophone. Uh, we also said that we want to support uh, francophone tourism. We will also invest $500,000 for different francophone organizations. Thank you. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Brampton is a city of over 600,000 people, yet we only have one hospital. Years of underfunding by liberal and conservative governments has put Brampton in a health care crisis that was declared before COVID-19. It is so bad at our single hospital in Brampton that patients are often transported outside of Brampton because there's simply not enough room. Despite this, the conservative government actually voted against investing in our health care system. Brampton deserves better, enough is enough. Will the Premier commit today to investing to fix our broken health care system? And that starts by building another hospital in Brampton. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I can advise the member opposite that over the last year since the pandemic started, we have created an additional 3,100 beds in hospitals across Ontario, which is equivalent to six community-sized hospitals. This has happened across the province, including in Brampton, including across Peel. And this is something that we're continuing to build because anticipating 
further hospitalizations as a result of the, the variants of concern, the UK variant, the Brazilian variant, and the South African variant, more people are hospitalized, and that is why we recently received $125 million in funding to create an additional 500 beds across the province. That serves the entire province, including the region of Peel, including Brampton. So this is something that we continue to monitor, we continue to reinforce, Response? we continue to put more money into more beds so that if people need to be hospitalized in the province of Ontario, there will be space for them. Supplementary question. Once again, member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Brampton is a city full of essential workers who risk their lives every single day going to work to move our economy. Last week, we learned about a devastating outbreak at a Brampton Amazon Fulfillment Center where hundreds of workers were infected with COVID-19, many new Canadians. Speaker, this is what healthcare experts have been warning about since this pandemic has started. Workplaces are one of the largest areas of spread for COVID-19, and it's why paid sick days are so important. So will the Premier finally accept the facts? Will he bring in paid sick days so workers don't have to choose between going to work sick or paying the bills, or will he continue to put workers and communities at risk? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, uh, as he knows, uh, we, of course, have uh, 20 paid sick days. I can uh, confirm for him that, uh, of course, we will not be following the NDP's advice. Now is certainly not the time to be reducing sick days uh, uh, from the 20 that are existing to the NDP proposal of 14. Uh, I wish that uh, uh, they would uh, reconsider that, Mr. Speaker. We've said right from the beginning that uh, basic days are important. That's why the Premier negotiated with his colleagues, uh, the other premiers and the federal government to ensure that uh, not only Ontarians but all, uh, all Canadians have access to 20 sick days. Uh, but again, to confirm for the member, there is absolutely no way that this government would reduce sick days from the current 20 to the NDP proposal of 14. Here, here. Order. The next question, the member for scarborough Gilder. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, when you sent thousands of students back to packed classrooms in the fall, you promised that you would do everything in your power to keep them safe. Now, on top of the chaos your government created in schools, hotspots like Scarborough have classrooms empty due to outbreaks of COVID-19, and these schools are now closed. Donwood Park Public School is not in session today. Speaker, the Premier is cutting $1.6 billion from classrooms next fall. And while Ontario Liberals would invest $8 billion in schools for our children's safety and their future, Ontario students, teachers, staff, education workers have faced and overcome enormous challenges during this pandemic, Question. as well as their families and parents. Is the Premier going to saddle them with a funding cut in this week's upcoming budget for education funding. I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair to respond on behalf of the government. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, let me remind the member opposite, it was her government that saddled students in the next generation with a $15 billion repair backlog. It was this minister, specifically, and her government that, in fact, closed 600 net schools in the heart of rural and suburban parts of the province, the most expensive childcare under her uh, leadership, the most expensive uh, hydro, the rates, go, the, the data points continue. I think it's rather concerning. What our government is doing and our premier is doing most specifically is investing in school safety by ensuring, yes, we've provided $1.6 billion unlocked for school safety. Part of that is to hire more staff to ensure our air ventilation systems are improved, of which 95% of schools have reported improvements in those schools themselves. PP extended to staff, extended to the students themselves. And the fact is, Speaker, that 99.2% of schools are open today, recognizing, as Response. the member opposite has acknowledged, we do face challenges in Ontario and in the world. We'll continue to remain vigilant, continue to invest in our students. Well and the supplementary question. Speaker, I would ask the member opposite uh, the minister to get his facts straight. The FAO has set the school repair backlog at $14.4 billion as of last fall. So what have you been doing these last two and a half years? Organizations like Fix Our Schools estimates Order. the backlog to be at $16.3 billion, so it is even growing Order. under your watch. So instead of pouring money into unneeded highways that nobody wants along that corridor, the Ontario Liberal Action Plan would 
invest in rebuilding schools and focus on upgrading HVAC systems, boilers, plumbing, windows, and under our plan, we would have a system for publicly reporting standards of good school repair as well as investing in new childcare spaces. Speaker, Question. why is this government investing in infrastructure like Highway 413 instead of the priorities for Ontario families such as schools? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I stand corrected. You're right. The member opposite is correct. Only a $14 billion deferred maintenance backlog in our schools in the province of Ontario. Only $14 billion. That's the legacy of the Del Duca Liberals. And I think the people of this province know better not to reward them with four years of government at a time when we need a government focused on the priorities of working families and parents, which includes more investment in health care and education and tax relief for working people. That is exactly what our Premier has done. In the context of our schools, we're very proud that, yes, we invest over a billion dollars per annum in, um, uh, in maintenance to ensure we keep these schools safe and modern. It's why we are investing in broadband expansion to all schools, which will be complete this coming September. It's why, Speaker, we invest half a billion dollars to build new schools, many of which an expansion in Scarborough and, 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 my, and my colleague Iris Babikin's riding. I mean, the fact is, Speaker, we are going to continue to invest more in Scarborough and Toronto and every Question. measure of the province because we recognize after 15 years of neglect by the former government, there's much more work to do in Ontario. Yeah. Next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, there are increasing concerns among my constituents in Durham about the ongoing issues around opioid addiction and overdose, which I know is not an issue unique to the riding of Durham. Every day, we know that men and women across the province are becoming victims to various deadly substances in our communities. As the minister has said in this house before, they could be brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, and friends. Recently, some estimates say that overdose rates in Ontario have increased by 59% since last year. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly impacted the mental health of too many Ontarians. Speaker, could the minister please update the members of this legislature on what the government is doing to address opioid addiction and overdoses across the province. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the member from Durham for her great advocacy on behalf of her community and the great work she does here at Queen's Park. Mr. Speaker, before the pandemic even hit us, our government committed to doing something about the ongoing issues around substance abuse, including opioid addiction and overdose, that have impacted the lives of Ontarians and, in some cases, entire communities for the, from the far north. And we know the COVID-19 pandemic has only presented us with more complex challenges. That's why, Mr. Speaker, our government took immediate action to provide $194 million in emergency funding to further expand the many mental health and addiction services, which are already being accessed by over 62,000 Ontarians. This is in addition to the $15.5 million we invested through our Roadmap to Wellness for additional Response. addiction supports across the province. Mr. Speaker, we are doing what the past Liberal and NDP governments ignored, and that is investing in a system that will give benefit to all the people in the province of Ontario when it comes to the health. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I know our government is continuing to make investments so Ontarians of all ages can have access to the high-quality mental health and addiction supports they expect and deserve. I want to thank the Minister on behalf of the thousands of Ontarians that are receiving direct support during these difficult times. As this pandemic continues, there's more work to be done. I know the Minister will continue to stand up for those impacted not only by addiction, but by mental health challenges as well. Speaker, would the minister please explain what other investments our government has made to help support Ontarians while on their road to recovery, and what investments have been made in those more remote and northern communities? Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, Mr. Speaker, we've made many investments throughout the entire province, from the GTA all the way to Ontario's far north, including many of the remote communities. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we've invested $32 million in funding specifically to address the needs of those living with mental health and addictions challenges in Northern Ontario. 
New funding, the investments include new funding for inpatient mental health beds, mobile crisis services, both in-home and mobile detox services, and opioid addiction services in municipalities like Timmins, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, and Manitoulin. But that's not all. Recently, we announced a significant investment in Ontario's Northwest, including the hiring of up to six psychiatrists. This investment will help around 1,800 unique patients each year through these resources. Mr. Speaker, I can keep going on about the investments that we've made, but the bottom line is that we're going to continue standing up for the mental health and supports for those suffering with addictions. It's our government Response. that is finally going to build a mental health and addiction system that works for everyone in this province. Honor St. Paul's. Uh, speaker, through you to the Premier, last Monday, when it was revealed that the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Education, the MPP for Niagara West, would attend an anti-choice event where organizers compared legal abortion to the Holocaust, the Premier promised only to talk to his member. It appears this talk was more of a pat on the back than a slap on the wrist. Because not only did the member happily join organizers who trivialized the atrocities of the Holocaust, but he spoke in strong opposition of the right to choose. My question to the Premier is this. Will the Premier tell Ontarians exactly what he said to his member and why he was allowed to attend this event at all? Thank you. To respond to the government, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, uh, the Premier was uh, was very clear with respect to his uh, displeasure with uh, with the member. But at the same token, I, I must say I'm, I'm equally uh, uh, troubled by uh, by the by the member opposite suggesting that uh, somehow a, a Premier or a leader would uh, order members or tell them what they can or cannot uh, do as as members. Look, we. Uh, uh, are, uh, are in full agreement, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, of, uh, of how important the issues uh, are that the member uh, across, uh, across Order. Ra 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 raised. Excuse me. We have spoken to uh, spoken to the member uh, uh, about it, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, the member will uh, uh, will uh, give uh, uh, a great deal of consideration on attending events like that in the future. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, to the people of Ontario and my community in St. Paul's, the House Leader just rambled for a minute, and I did not hear a single word. Nobody in this House heard what the, what the House Leader had to say. This is an important issue. Again, Speaker, through you to the Premier, even the Premier's colleagues in the Federal Party are willing to take a stronger stance than he is in the face of some Conservative Party members attempting to put abortion policy on the Convention agenda, the Federal Conservative leader came out to publicly state that he is pro-choice, while the federal leader is staring down party members who seek to threaten abortion access. The Premier of Ontario is right here cheering them on with pom-poms. Why is the Premier allowing harmful anti-choice sentiment to grow in his Conservative caucus? Can we please get an answer from the Premier of Ontario? Thank you. And to reply, that's absolutely incorrect, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, we have uh, said right from the beginning, and we continue to be, this legislature has voted uh, with respect to uh, a women's right uh, to choose, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, uh, and we will, of course, uh, defend, uh, defend that uh, as a government, as this legislature has, has on many occasions uh, reaffirmed, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. There is no uh, uh, wavering on that. Uh, uh, speaker, so uh, with respect to the member's uh, direct question, yes, we will continue to support a woman's uh, right to choose until this legislature chooses to do something differently. We will support that and we will defend that at every instance. Next question, order the member for Cambridge. Chance for the premier. Last week, after months of watching owners of restaurants and bars have to close down their businesses, the government made changes to increase the capacity limits for restaurants, bars, and other food and drink establishments in the red and orange zones. For months, establishments in the red zone could only allow 10 people in their premises and in the orange zone, 50. The government had the power, due to Bill 195, to make these changes earlier without requiring a vote in this legislature and before many went out of business. What took the government so long? Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. Well, I would say to the member opposite, the need for public health measures. We have to keep the level of transmission of COVID-19 uh, under control as much as we can. That's what we've been working towards. The variants of concern have considerably upset the direction that we were headed because there are the uh, variants of concern. The UK, uh, Brazilian and South African are much more transmissible. They end up in more hospitalizations, more severe cases of COVID, and sadly, more deaths. That is what we've been following all along. We've been listening to our public health experts, Dr. Williams and the public health measures table, and we had to wait until they felt that changes could be made for the health and safety of all Ontarians, and that's exactly what we did. And the supplementary question. Well, despite their pious claims to the contrary, it doesn't appear that the government is following much science in its decision-making. On the same day last week that capacity limits were increased in red and orange zones, Total COVID cases in Ontario spiked to over 1,700 daily for each of the last three days. Last November, when these red and orange capacity limits were set, COVID cases on that day were just over 1,300. What part of the science is the government following when it decides after months to let restaurants operate even when daily COVID cases are increasing? Couldn't this same decision have been made months ago before thousands were for forced to close down their restaurants due to the government's questionable decision making? And the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, once again, we follow public health measures. There were changes that were made, uh, particularly in areas in Grey, in Peel, and Toronto, to allow for outdoor patios to open as long as the physical distancing measures were followed. But the difference, of course, is the variance of concern with the uh, the original COVID cases moving downward. We could see in the the. Um, uh, Dr. Brown in his table told us that in their, uh, their modeling that we could see the variants of concern taking over from the, uh, the original COVID, which we are now seeing. But we are watching that very carefully. We're watching what's happening in our hospitals. We're watching to make sure that our ICU beds are not going to be overwhelmed. So we are doing all of the work that we're doing is in accordance with the advice that's being given to us by Dr. Williams and the public health measures table, because our first and foremost Response. priority is the health and safety of all Ontarians. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Seniors in long-term care homes have been in isolation for over a year, many confined to their rooms, separated from their designated caregivers without meaningful access to the people that love them and provide the support they need to stay mentally and physically healthy. Sitting alone in their rooms, their health rapidly declining with no stimulation, no exercise. Some have lost the will to live. Some die from isolation. Most have not felt fresh air or been out in the sunshine since the beginning of the pandemic. The majority of long-term care residents across the province have been vaccinated against COVID-19. Designated caregivers are being vaccinated too. Meaningful access can happen in a safe manner with proper PPE testing, infection prevention and control measures in place. Speaker, why won't the Premier take concrete action to ensure these families are immediately reunited, that no one is denied meaningful access to their caregivers, Question. and residents in care homes can leave their rooms to enjoy the outdoor? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Back in March of 2020, we had to take the very, very difficult decision to restrict access to visitors into long-term care. That was done uh, with very little understanding of what COVID-19 presented. We now have vaccines, as you mentioned. We now have testing. We have additional measures. However, the science is still evolving. We must continue to be vigilant. If we look at BC and we see homes that were vaccinated, staff and residents having outbreaks, this is something that we have to be very, very vigilant and cautious with these new variants. And we took the action of uh, allowing residents uh, to meet with their essential caregivers. This was an important step in that direction. We know how hard it is on residents and, and families. There's no doubt Response. about that. The essential caregivers were a step in that direction, including four homes in outbreak. And we're continuing to review this with uh, experts in public health uh, and with uh, the medical and scientific knowledge. I appreciate your concerns. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the minister is saying that caregivers are allowed in even during an, out an outbreak, and yet 90-year-old Heinz Zebel has not been outside to the home in six months, and his family has only ever been allowed window visits with him. 
Speaker, many long-term care residents have been locked away, denied meaningful access to their designated essential caregivers for over a year. Policies implemented by care homes across the province differ greatly when it comes to caregiver access or residents going outdoors. The government's guidance means nothing to these homes. Mental and physical decline in care home residents is increasing as isolation takes a devastating toll. For some, it leads to simply giving up and death. Vaccines have been the light at the end of a very long tunnel for many residents in long-term care. Medical experts say the vaccines are working. They're reducing the cases of COVID-19 in care homes. We're down to 11 active cases across the entire province. Question. It's over one year into the pandemic, yet this government continues to allow care homes to deny residents meaningful access to their caregivers and fresh air. The Premier has a legislative solution before him since September, something they supported. So why won't he immediately pass my More Than a Visitor Act and reunite families once and for all? Mr. Longton, Thank you, Speaker, and once again, thank you for the important question. Uh, there is no doubt that the well-being of residents and their families requires a level of, of visitation, and so that is what we've been trying to do by having the essential caregivers. If we look at the science, we know that the vaccines are not 100 percent effective at stopping the transmission. They are not. We have to look at BC and learn from the experiences elsewhere. We are working with our public health units, our medical offices of health, and for homes in outbreak, uh, you know, one essential caregiver is permitted for each resident. Uh, that is Order. the nature of public health. The medical officers of health do have the ability to restrict that, and we have seen that happen. Uh, public health units may Order. temporarily limit visitors in situations with outbreaks Response. over precaution. So this is something that we are working with with our partners to understand how we can move forward with the very, very difficult situation when uh, outbreaks occur in homes and deaths occur. We do not want to go back to where we were with wave one. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Last week, the FAO reported that expensive green energy contracts are part of the problem of Ontario's high electricity rates. And with this government's subsidy of rates for large businesses, quote, the costs are being moved from ratepayers over to the taxpayers, end quote, to the tune of $2.8 billion for the first three years totaling $15.2 billion of subsidies by 2040. Instead of subsidizing big business on the backs of the taxpayer, why won't the government do what is necessary? Defend the taxpayer, use the legal power of this legislature, and terminate those green energy contracts for wind and solar early, saving ratepayers and taxpayers billions in the process. And the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is, uh, is uh, quite correct in uh, the, uh, the, the former Liberal government's green energy uh, uh, program was uh, was implemented in a in a very disastrous way for the people of the province of Ontario. As a member will know, as uh, she campaigned on on the promise uh, that was fulfilled by this government to ensure that uh, the the Fair Hydro Plan uh, was open and that people could understand the cost of the Fair Hydro Plan. Uh, very correct in, in 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 how expensive it has become. It is a multi-billion dollar expense to the people of the province of Ontario. That's not to suggest that green energy is an important part of our of our energy mix in the province. Of Ontario, it is, Mr. Speaker. What, uh, where the mistake was made was by the previous Liberal government in uh, in contracts that we could not afford at a time when we did not need those uh, uh, those energy uh, uh, systems uh, put in place, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue to ensure that uh, it is open and that people can see Response. it. We follow the advice of the Auditor General. Uh, uh, speaker, and I am I'm, I'm, I'm confident in the fact that we continue to keep those rates low for all of the people of the province of Ontario, uh, and that uh, energy will continue to be something that is, a, is an important driver of economic activity. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Despite promising to cut rates by 12 percent, another promise made, promise broken, this government has been subsidizing, not cutting, electricity rates, but only for the largest businesses in the province, not, I might add, for residential, farm or small business. This government has the power to shut down expensive green energy contracts through, through legislation and to cut rates, but they choose not to. It is the same legislative power the government has used to tell restaurants how many people they can serve. Additional expensive electricity by wind turbines in the Nation Rise Wind Project is being constructed in the riding of Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. That will cost ratepayers $400 million over 20 years for electricity we don't need and is in surplus. Why doesn't the government defend the taxpayer, use the power of this legislature the same way it uses its power in restaurants, and legislate an end to these green energy contracts and decommission surplus wind turbine projects, starting with the Nation Rise project? 
Government House Leader. Of course, uh, the member will know that uh, we have uh, reviewed all of uh, all of those con all contracts, Mr. Speaker, and those contracts that could be uh, uh, terminated uh, uh, were in fact uh, terminated early on. Uh, one of the first things that we did uh, as a government, we have continued to keep rates low for the people of the province of Ontario. In fact, uh, uh, when compared to what the costs of energy would have been had the Liberals been re-elected, we have been able to reduce those by 18 percent. We've gone even further during the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, uh, by reducing rates for all of the people of the province of Ontario and including businesses, small, medium and large, uh, uh, small, medium and large job creators. They're an important part of uh, the economy, whether it's restaurants, whether it's our large uh, job creators. Uh, they're an important part of keeping this economy going so that we can continue to pay for safe schools, long-term care, health care, Mr. Speaker. So they certainly make no apologies for, uh, for helping uh, individual Ontarians and certainly no apologies for helping small, medium and large job creators. Response? Are so important to the economic recovery of the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, Member for St. Catharines. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. A 64-year-old St. Catharines resident, Rick McCallion, is living with cancer. Rick recently called into public health. He was asking when he could expect to get his vaccine in Niagara. Mr. McCallion was told it could be June. This would be slower than other regions, since Niagara has the second highest concentration of seniors in Ontario. It will take longer to vaccinate our seniors, given our allotment of vaccines. I stood in this house, and I said it before. Our pharmacies have the capacity. Our dense senior community has the need. Will the Premier recognize that Niagara has one of the oldest populations in Ontario? In addition, will the Premier guarantee we top the list for immediate inclusion in the pharmacy vaccination rollout? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. We are in the process right now of expanding the number of pharmacies that will be able to administer the vaccine. That will be done within the next two weeks. We expect to double that to approximately 700 pharmacies across the province, including in Niagara, and then doubling that again within the next month. However, given the situation that the member just suggested with respect to this gentleman who has a pre-existing condition, that this is a situation where likely he will receive a call from his primary care provider, who will also be receiving uh, the vaccines as well, and they, he will be able to then go to his primary care provider to receive his, uh, his vaccine, whatever type it may be, because that is what has been planned by the Vaccine Committee and the Vaccine Task Force is for people with pre-existing conditions because Response. the primary care provider is aware of those specific conditions, the primary care provider will be reaching out to them and making appointments for them to receive their vaccinations within their primary care provider's offices. And the supplementary question, member for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to start by thanking the Niagara Public Health. They're doing an incredible job on our vaccines in Niagara. As my colleague mentioned, Niagara is one of the highest concentration of seniors in the country. Those seniors are put at risk in January when this government diverted over 5,500 doses of Moderna vaccines away from Niagara. The only way to keep them safe and save lives in Niagara is by ramping up the vaccine efforts. Pharmacies in my riding are ready to do what they do best, and that's save lives. A great local partner, Simpsons Pharmacy, has 3,500 people on a wait list. They just need the supply of vaccines so they can do their job. Will you move immediately to include Niagara in the areas in which pharmacies can administrate vaccines? A simple yes or no would do. Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, all of the public health units in Ontario, all 34 of them, are doing an amazing job getting the vaccines out. We have administered over 1.5 million doses thus far and uh, protected our residents of long-term care, retirement homes, and other areas, and we're working through. We've got uh, the uh, majority of people over 80 vaccinated in uh, most, if not all, of the public health units, which is why we've been able to move that down to age 75, and that's where they are receiving uh, uh, applications and 
um, times to come in for the, to receive the vaccines. But, Speaker, I think before I get into the substance of my answer, I think it's time to dispel a myth that has been circulating by, in Niagara that Niagara is not receiving their fair share of vaccines. That is not so. Vaccines are being distributed fairly in Niagara. In fact, Niagara is receiving Response. above their fair share of vaccines, and we will continue to allocate vaccines based on population and based on particular circumstances. But Niagara is receiving the vaccines that they're entitled to. Thank you. The next question. The member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Associate Minister of Health, uh, responsible for uh, mental health and addictions. Um, the Kirk and Lake Opioid Task Force is meeting on a regular basis um, to deal with increased uh, opioid addiction problem in Temiskaming and we are dealing one of the things that's come come to our attention is during the COVID epidemic Temiskaming has been um, left it's basically it's, an, it's a treatment desert because the treatment centers are all in our major centers in Northern Ontario and if you are addicted or, or want help or quite frankly need mental health services Temiskaming is not the place to live because we're being excluded. The minister just said in one of his responses that the, the, the Tory plan should work for everyone in the province. I question and ask whether he would work with the opioid tax force and work with himself to make sure that the people in Timiskaming also have equivalent services as the rest of the province. Thank you. To respond, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the member opposite, I'm sure, is aware, our government was the government that implemented, about a year ago, the Roadmap to Wellness. And the Roadmap to Wellness is a foundational document based on work that goes back to 2010, which I might add, nothing had been done with until our government came to power. We made a commitment of investing $3.8 billion in mental health and addictions in the province, and we started by laying the foundational work that needed to be done. In addition to looking at the lifespan and the age groups within the lifespan of an individual from birth to death, we looked at how we will implement and develop a scale of us in each constituency where individuals will have the supports they need closest to their homes. That is a fundamental part of what we're doing. In addition to that, we're also developing a strategy to ensure that culturally appropriate services are delivered, whether it's farmers, whether Spons. it's Indigenous communities. We are building a model, and of course, with COVID-19, I've had to speed up the things that we're doing with respect to virtual care, but we are building that model and we're looking after the people, every person in the province of Ontario. Thank you. That concludes our question period this morning. We now have a number of deferred votes. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 254, an act to amend various acts with respect to elections and members of the Assembly. On March 3rd, 2021, Mr. Downey moved second reading of Bill 254, and on March 11th, 2021, Mr. Gill moved that the question be now put. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. Gill's motion that the question be now put. And I will ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies. <laughs>